I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Verse 19 of Matthew 6 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Now, we're going to talk about kingdom supply a little bit next week. Um, next week might be the end of the series, I'm, I, I'm thinking, but we'll see. Um, I want to talk about this verse in particular next week. Um, as I alluded to, I think last week or a couple weeks ago, that when it says lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, it doesn't mean that you put them in heaven and you can never access them. It doesn't mean that you can't make heavenly withdrawals. It doesn't mean that you can't access the things of the kingdom. In fact, you're supposed to. The only thing that it's saying is where you, if you lay it up there, that's the place where moths can't eat it, rust can't destroy it, and thieves can't break through and steal. It's the ultimate safe deposit box. It is the place where you can lay up eternal treasures and then you can call those things that be not as though they are and you can make withdrawals out of that heavenly account as you go through life where your kids are concerned and where your health is concerned. And you, you see what I'm saying? So see, it's not just monetary transactions. This is everything that, the, that money can't buy, can buy. It's everything money can't buy. It's all the fruit of the spirit. It's the things, it's the authority of the believer. It's, it's just everything that we're called to live in. Right? So um, let's, let's continue reading. Verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Now see what, <laughs> that's really, that's exactly what I was just talking about for the last few minutes. When you think that you have revelation knowledge on something, if you think that you've seen the light on something, but it turns out to be dark, darkness, but you think it's light, if the light that's in you is darkness, Jesus said, how great is that darkness? In other words, it's so big, you better watch out because you think it's light. That's the problem. You think that it's light, but you're really walking in darkness. And that's the trick of the enemy. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that Satan, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of them lest they believe, right? Lest they hear, he doesn't want them to hear the glorious gospel of Christ, right? Or the, literally the gospel, the good news of his glory. So he keeps, the enemy keeps people's minds darkened, keeps your eyes darkened, keeps you walking in a place where you think you're okay. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Let's keep going. No man, no man, everybody shout that out. No man. <laughs> no man can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one and love the other or hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Here we go, ready? Verse 25. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. I'm gonna let that settle for just a second. Take no thought for your life. Amplified Bible says, stop being, stop it. Stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious, and worried. You are not even called, I mean, if, if the Lord speaks to you to do something, the very first thing, invariably, the very first thing that everybody thinks of is what's that going to cost? It's the first thing. Not just, that just doesn't happen with pastors. Start this outreach. A pastor is, is very uh, tempted. The very first thing is to start putting a pencil to it and find out, well, how much is this going to cost me? How much is it going to cost the church? I need to be a good steward over this. We don't have that much in savings, this, that, blah, 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 right? Same thing in your life. God calls you to start a feeding ministry or God calls you to step out and help somebody at work. God speaks to your heart and tells you before a coworker calls in late, tells you by word of knowledge that there is a, uh, that, that, that somebody needs something, has a need, and then you find out they show up late and said that, you know, they have car trouble. The Lord already told you to pay for it. Now, you don't, it doesn't matter if it's $500 or $1,000 or $100. He told you to pay for it. So then, we don't have to worry about how much it costs if he told me to do it. Do you realize that the price tag on something is not even your half of the covenant? We're in a covenant relationship. He leads, I follow. He feeds, I swallow. <laughs> he, he, he tells me where to go, I go. He tells me what to say, I open my mouth. 
He tells me when to listen and I shut up. He gives the instruction and I'm here. I'm at your command. I'm your servant. I'm your child. I love you. What can I do for you today, Father? That's my half of the covenant. He says, do this. All of a sudden, I flip covenants and I get over here on this other side of, and try and get on his side and say, okay, God, now how are we going to figure out how much this is going to cost? That's not your covenant. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the God that always provides. If he called you to it, he's going to see you through it. If he tells you to do it, he's going to provide the means to do it. Amen. 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 Or the partnership with somebody else that can do it. I'm not just talking about church partnership. If he maybe tells you to do something and you've got no idea, he's speaking to somebody else in your office to do the same thing. Come on now. And you got part of it and they've got the other part. And you're so concerned about the part you don't have that you question, is God really telling me to do this? Well, maybe he just told you to be still and listen to him for a little while. Amen? Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment or clothing? I make a little joke here sometimes. It says here at the beginning of the verse, take no thought for your life. And then at the end it says, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment or clothing? Well, you know, I've said often that there is a difference in zoe life which is the life of God. That's the Greek word. It's literally zoe, literally means life as God has it and enjoys it. It's the same zoe life in John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have zoe life. Okay? It's the same life. It's life as God has it and enjoys it. Now, there's a difference in zoe life and yoe life. There's a difference in the life that we're called to live and the life that we can create. I realize in context, I'm not trying to preach this a different way. I realize in context, he's, he's talking about the same thing. He's saying, is not, is not the life? Listen, because the life becomes your life. Oh, amen. When, you, when you become a believer in Jesus, when you receive him, <coughs> you're infused with Zoe life. So it permeates every part of you, your spirit man, and you've been made alive with the kingdom life that God has placed on the inside of you. And so your life now is hidden in Christ. Your life is hidden in his life. And so now when you look at each other, when you look at you, when the unbelieving world looks at you, they see Jesus. Why do they see Jesus? Because you wear a certain outfit or because you drive a certain car or because you go to a certain church? No, they see Jesus because they see compassion. They see Jesus because they see a person who walks in faith and always understands that what God has called them to do, they're gonna be able to do it. They're well able to take the land. They're well able to see out what God's called them to do. They're well able to follow his instruction because they know the instructor. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah, yes. amen? Now, so, so the problem if we get over into what's it cost, we're getting on the wrong side of the covenant, then, then see, um, we underestimate our ability to do things. Mm. See, Holy Spirit is the helper. Mm -hmm. He's not the doer. Amen. He's the helper. You're the doer. <laughs> now, there's a, there's a big problem. People get that backwards. And they think, well, God, if I could just pray enough, I can get God to move, and I could get God to do something, and I'll help him any way I can. They make him the doer and us the helper. He's the helper. He helps us. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I can do. I can do it. I'm well able to do it because I have help. Now, I'm not saying you're the doer and the helper. My goodness, you couldn't help. Don't help yourself. You need the helper. I need the helper. My goodness, I couldn't stand up here right now and say 10 words without the helper. Trust me. You guys know my story. Some, a lot of you know my story. I skipped out on all my friends took a speech class in high school. I didn't take it because I was nervous. I would not speak in front of people. <laughs> Everybody else took that class. Mrs. Moat taught that class. She got married, I think, after I graduated. But I don't know what her, what her name is now. Everybody took that class. Not me. <laughs> not me. You kidding me? This is a, I have a choice to take speech or not. Well, then I choose not to because I'm not going to get up and see what somebody else is going to say about me and how they're going to, oh, come on now. 
doesn't God have a sense of humor with that one? Right? <laughs> but here's, now, do you guys remember, um, you remember a few weeks ago, turn, turn with me to Luke chapter 21. I want to read a verse of scripture that I think we read the first week of this series, I believe. Luke 21 and verse 34. It said, take heed. Well, I'll read verse 33 too. Heaven and earth shall pass away, Jesus says, but my words shall not pass away. Glory to God for that. Verse 34 says, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that the day comes upon you unawares, the cares of this life. So, as I said before, this verse of scripture puts care and fear and worry on the same level as drunkenness. When you try to make a decision out of caring about it, fearing something, worrying about it, all these things, it's like you're making a decision in a drunken stupor. You can't see clearly. It's foggy. You don't, you don't have insight. Now, our job is to follow the direction of Holy Spirit. Our job is to understand, Ephesians chapter 1, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened that we may know what is the hope of our calling, right? So you can, the, when your eyes are open to something and you have understanding, you can know something. We got people thinking they know something and they don't understand anything. And they don't understand anything because they haven't seen anything. Except maybe a couple of YouTube videos. You understand what I'm saying? You know, come on now. And so when Jesus, like the men in the boat, okay, let's go back to last week. We talked about uh, Mark chapter four, right? Those men, they didn't realize that Jesus cared for them. In fact, they woke him up and they said with their own lips, they said, master, carest thou not that we perish? Don't you care about us? Don't you care that we're dying here? The boat's full of water and we're going under. Don't you care? Now, here's the thing. He did not... Um, he didn't tell them how bad that was on a care level. He looked at them and said, said, how is it that you're so fearful, O ye of little faith? See, he brought it full circle back into the faith realm because he knows that to operate in kingdom principles, they're gonna have to at some point walk out something that they can't see at some point in time. <coughs> Thomas needed to see the nails in the hand. Thomas needed to see that. Jesus said it's much more blessed. It's a way more blessed life to live this out when you haven't seen and you still believe. So when Jesus now says, listen, Anthony, you're going to the other side of whatever it is. That was a lake. But you're going to the other side of this mess or you're going to the other side of that. He's calling me into a, a three-year plan of something or a five-year plan of something. And maybe not call it, he doesn't call it that. But I can see in my mind's eye, I can see in my spirit, man, the steps sometimes when God speaks something to you, it just rolls out in your spirit. Step one, two, three, four. And you can see how it's going to unfold. And you know that it's going to take six months or you know whatever. But there's a peace because he's given you the ability to see something. And when you see something, you can understand it. When you can understand it, then you can know it. Right? And to know the love of God. Amen? So if, if I'm going to the other side of whatever it is, and he told me that we're going to the other side. He told me that he's with me and he's seeing me through this. Now, how am I ever going to get halfway across like those men in that boat and allow fear to overtake? I'm not going to say overtake the faith because that's really not it. As I, as I said last week, you guys know where I stand on this. Fear and faith are the same. They're just polar opposites. Right. They're both a belief system, yes. right? right? Faith believes that what God's word said is true. Fear believes the exact opposite. Fear believes, I heard this, but I don't believe it. I don't believe I'll be able to come. Listen, listen to the verbiage. Why don't you believe that? Well, I believe it's just going to be too tough. People say, people will tell you what they're saying, what they're, what's on the inside of them, what their words. Amen? Hallelujah. Why don't you change your belief system? Why don't you believe that you'll be able to make it? Why don't you believe that this or that? See, that's calling those things that be not as though they are. And when you live that way, now all of a sudden you have to live a life that's on record. And there's a lot of people that are afraid to do that. I don't want to do that. Man, what if, I, if I'm going to stand up and really dare to believe what God's word says and all my situations and circumstances are screaming something else at me? 
Yeah, that's how I am going to live. If I'm going to be just, if I'm going to be righteous, if I'm going to literally do things the right way, the righteous way, the justified way, then the just have to live by faith. Yes. Amen? Amen. Um, see, because doubt means, I just use that word doubt. Let me, let me just hit that really quickly. Doubt means to hesitate. It really doesn't mean that you don't have faith. Do you remember the time that the man came up to, uh, to Jesus for his child and said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Now, if you don't understand kind of spiritual things, that really seems like that's just super weird. Like, what do you mean? Either you believe or you don't. So I believe, help my unbelief. Like, so... Um, I, heard, I heard a man preach this a long time ago. I, I won't say any names, uh, but, but I heard him say that you can have faith in your heart right. yeah. and doubt in your head at the exact same time. Yep. Yep. And I love that. I love because, see, that helps me. That helps me when I come up against things in life and I am, I am believing God for this or that. But see, the enemy doesn't work spiritually against you. He can't have you spiritually. He doesn't have you. Now you can entertain fallen angels. The Bible says that we can entertain angels unawares, right? So there, there evidently are times that, um, that you're in a spiritual battle. And thank God, we need to, maybe I need to teach maybe some more on angels because we have help. The Bible says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for, minister for? They don't minister to you, they minister for you. That's one of those uh, misquoted scriptures. Angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to us. No, they're not. They're sent to minister for you. They're sent to help take up arms with you and stand against the wiles of the enemy. Right? Because we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, and uh, wicked uh, spirits in heavenly places or high places, high realms. That's who we're warring against. So people are, I mean, don't you worry about demonology and demon stuff? I don't need to, pr I don't need to preach a 28-part series on demonology. <laughs> the only thing that I need to teach you about demonology is this. Are you guys ready? Yes. I'm going to give you the full course in about 30 seconds. Demons are fallen angels. And their commander-in-chief is outranked by my angel's commander-in-chief. The end. That's the whole course. Listen here. I'm telling you right now, you don't need to study demons and study. I know that there's a spirit of this out there. Well, why don't you take authority over it? That's right. Why don't you dare to stand up in the boat of your life right in the middle of that storm and speak to the principality of the powers of the air at work in your life and tell them to shut up in the name of Jesus? That's right. All authority. Yeah, you've, you've been given the ability to do that. You've been given the power of attorney to use the name of Jesus. He said, go out, go on the, the entire world. <laughs> Jerusalem. Judea, Samaria, the uttermost bounds of the earth. <laughs> I had somebody question this week why I'm going on, question me why I'm going on a missions trip. We have, we have people here in Lebanon that need you. Why would you go there? I won't even go down that road. <laughs> totally misunderstanding. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? There is a world that's lost and a world that's dying. There's a world that's hurting. And if I've been given a voice to be able to speak into the darkness, hallelujah, yeah, you get it. Your son's given his life for it. Yeah. Given his life to it, I should say. I appreciate you, Tyler. You're watching it now or later tonight or whatever, but I appreciate you, brother. Move to a foreign land. I'll be with you ministering at some point. So anyway, that'll be fun. And we'll, we'll go stomp some demons in 
Yucatan, Mexico, and we'll take a team of, of you guys, and we'll go down there. That'll be glory to God. But here's the thing. Doubt doesn't mean that you don't have faith. Doubt means literally to hesitate. The word, it literally means, it means you're not fully persuaded. Yeah, I know that I'm called to do that, but. See, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I know that you're able, but are you willing? Come on. God is able, God is able. Well, that's good to have that be the mantra of your church. God is able, that's great. But when are we gonna get over into God is willing? Because the Bible says even the demons understand that he's able. They understand that who he is. They tremble at his power. They know about him. At least we can get a little bit further along than that and dare to stand up and say, yeah, I know you're able, God, and I'm thankful for it, but I'm even more thankful that you're so willing to work in my situation and you're willing, not just, listen, you're, you're not just willing to be there for me, but to, you're willing to get right in there and be in me and with me in the trenches and go to war with these principalities and the things that are standing against us that are, that are oh, this, is, this fallen world stinks. It stinks. And, and people, listen, I was talking to a brother, doesn't go to this church. I doubt anybody in here knows him. Well, you know, I'm sure somebody might know him. But anyway, he's got a daughter, full-grown daughter, has kids of her own. And she was raised in church, and now she's just pretty much, she's almost atheist. She's about as agnostic as you can get. I mean, you know, she's very... She's not sure about all this stuff. And, uh, and, and, and the, the guy I was talking to, you know, her kids, obviously his grandkids now are starting to say, I'm not sure I believe in God, Papa. So, you know, he was pouring his heart out to me and asking me some things, and I was able to minister to him this week. So it was good. Good to have friends, right? Um, and so one of the things that this girl said to her dad, who was raised in church and anything, she said, one of the reasons that I'm not sure about this is how would a God, a loving God, allow things like abortion? I know who she just voted for. Yes. So how can you question, how can you question why God would allow it when he put the authority in our hands and we collectively, well, I don't believe that we collectively did, but... They say that collectively as a nation, we want that. No. Now how? How? See, it doesn't go, that they, they don't understand. That's, a, that's a, um, a gross misunderstanding or lack of revelation of what I was saying about Adam in the garden. See, God is not in control of this. The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. He's put into our hands everything that we need to literally live this life out the way that we've been called to live it and see God's kingdom Come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yes. There's going to be a day when there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. There's going to be a day when all that you see is going to be gone. And it's going to be recreated. But until now, the earth itself is groaning. It's yearning for a manifestation of the sons of God, the kingdom revelation to just absolutely overtake this fallen situation right now. Yes. It's our job to do that. Yes. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Thank the Lord Jesus. So, but now here, in the time I have left, I want to talk a little bit about, more about value um, because I want you to see, back to Matthew chapter 5, um, 6, 6, excuse me, Matthew chapter 6. I want to read verse, let's start in verse 25, and I'll read about the birds and the lilies really quickly. Well, we just read verse 25, so I'll just start with verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. He feeds them. Are ye not much better than they? The answer is yes. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature or one minute to your lifespan? And why do you take thought for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon, in all his glory, underline that word glory, was not arrayed or clothed like one of these. <clears throat> Wherefore, 
If God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how shall he not much more clothe ye, you, O ye of little faith? Now I want you to see the connection there between faith and walking this out. Because God, in essence, values, Jesus is saying here, that God considers it to be more valuable to have faith than everything that Solomon had. Solomon, in all of his glory, he said, take no thought for your life is not the life more than, right? So Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one lily, like one flower. Why? Because the lily understands that its source is from the inside out. So Jesus was teaching them before the cross. In essence, see, he knew what was happening in a few months or a couple years down the road. He knew he was going to go to the cross, and he knew that there were going to be Every one of those men and women he was talking to that was alive after the cross, they were going to have an opportunity to receive the new birth, and they were going to have an opportunity to live like a lily from the inside out. Amen. 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 Now, what I want to say to you here is, um, if, if you don't get the proper perspective on this, okay, if you don't realize that the life of God is where the true value is, then you'll begin putting false value on other things. All right, I wanna, I wanna stick here and I wanna teach this for just a few minutes for, um, today. When you place value in the wrong things, it's a telltale sign to yourself, not to me or not to anybody else. I mean, it can be, but that's something that you need to understand on the inside of you that you're going down the wrong path valuing all this other stuff, whatever it is, whether it's a job, whether it's a car, college education, all those kind of things, okay? I'm not saying those things are not important, okay? I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying food is not important. Jesus isn't saying that there's no importance to food. Clearly, you need to eat most days, right? If you, if you fast too long, I've done a seven-day fast. I've never done a 40-day fast. <clears throat> I've done seven-day fast more anyway, but so eventually you're going to have to eat. You don't eat, you're in trouble. And as long as you're attending this church, you got to wear clothes. <laughs> we don't have a whole lot of rules. That's one of them. There'll be people at the door ask you to participate virtually if you'd rather not. <laughs> That's okay. You do you, just not in here, right? Okay. So here's the thing though. He's not saying that clothes aren't important. He's not saying food's not important. And this is not, this is not a, a, um, a message of don't do anything, don't increase, don't grow, don't you know, increase. This is, this is saying that, um, how can I put this? Um, it, this is saying not to worry, watch this, because worry can't increase you. That's the way to say it. Worry can't increase you. Worry can't add anything. In fact, let's look at a couple of verses here. Look at verse 27. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to underline three words. Verse 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to a stature? So look, add, underline the word add. Verse 28, <clears throat> and why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Underline grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. So we're supposed to consider how they grow. Watch this. And then, of course, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Add, grow, added. So in Jesus' mind, he's thinking along the, ter the terms of increase. He's thinking along the lines of increase. He's trying to teach you how to increase in your life. He's trying to teach you how to grow, how things can be added to you, how you can get influence in this world, how you can get to a place where kingdom influence in your life is so much greater and of greater value than the worldly influence all around you in your world. He's trying to get you to a place where you can increase to the point so much that you can dominate those things. So the kingdom will grow it. The kingdom will add it. The kingdom will produce it, but watch this, mammon can't get its mitts on it. Like, like sand through your fingertips, the tighter you squeeze, the more it comes out. That's the world system. I've heard people say, liken it to walking around with a hole in your pocket, right? 
Fast as, as fast as you put it in is as fast as it goes out. That's mammon system. That's, that's curse. Glory to God. The Bible describes the curse of the law in uh, Deuteronomy <clears throat> chapter 28, starting in verse 15 or so, all the way through verse 50-something or 60. I, I, need to, I should know that. But anyway, that's the curse of the law. And all of you guys, I encourage you to go read the entire curse of the law. Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 60, right around there. Read every bit of it. Now, I, I really enjoy the first 14 verses. <laughs> but now check this out. Let me, let me do a little, just a little bit of a correction here. I've heard it preached before Galatians 3.13 says that we've been redeemed from the curse of the law, Christ being made a curse for us. Watch this. So that the blessing of Abraham can come on the Gentiles, right? right. So I've heard it preached that we're redeemed from the curse of the law, Deuteronomy 28 verses 15 on. We're redeemed from all that so that we can have the first 14 verses. That's not what it says. Right. That's not the blessing of Abraham. That's the blessing of the law. We're redeemed from the curse of the law so that we can have Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, and even more in verse uh, chapters 15 and on through there. When Abraham is blessed and when Abraham, when God, um, you know, cuts covenant with him and, and says that all the, and in you all the nations of the earth, all the people groups of the earth will be blessed. And you'll lend to many and you won't borrow. And anybody that blesses you, I'll bless them. And anybody that curses you, I'll curse them. That's the blessing that we've received. He's the father of our faith. God's our heavenly father. Abraham's the father of our faith. Why? Because he called those things that, that called those things that be not as though they were. He lived a faith life, and Hebrews 11 says that it was so real to him, he was so looking for a city that was made without hands that he walked around as a sojourner. He didn't, even, he didn't really even think that he belonged here because he was looking so forward to Jesus. Now, this is, what, this is what, how we do this. It's by not living a mammon-filled life of trying to grasp everything and trying to figure it all out. That's why Jesus said, take no thought for it. Don't even think about those things. Don't even think about them. Glory be to God. Now, if you're taking notes, write this down. The kingdom will grow it, add it, produce it, but mammon can't get it. See, you can't get glory that fades not away <laughs> in a system that's doomed for only temporary success. There's a glory that will not fade away. But people try to get their hands on it in a system. It's doomed to only have temporary success. It'll work for a little while, but then it won't. Why? Because no flesh can glory in his presence. Amen. See, you can't, you, you cannot be moved by your flesh and, and moved by feelings and emotions and things like that and think that you're going to get in the glory realm. That's why this is a church. I'll just go ahead and say it. We are not a seeker-friendly church. Now, people are walking around and come through the doors and check us out online and whatever, and they're seeking something. Well, we'll be friendly to the people. But we're not going to be seeker-friendly. We're going to be glory-friendly. I'm going to say it again. We're going to be glory friendly. Because if they walk into a place where the glory of God is in manifestation and they hear truth and their eyes are open and they can see something that they've been going to church for 20 years and they've never seen before, now all of a sudden there's a hunger in them. You don't have to wonder if they're going to be seeking after if they want to come back. That's fine. And I've said it a million times, this church isn't for everybody, but it's for some people. You know, I, I mean, um, amen, that's it. <laughs> Fear, care, and worry serves mammon. Write that down. Fear, care, and worry serves mammon. Faith serves God. Remember what he said? He said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil or spin. Even so, Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Watch this. He says this. How much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? See, so he likens faith to be an opposite of care, fear, and worry. Yeah. Amen. 
You see that? You see how that's working? And do you see how then Peter, we talked about last week, when he said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, casting your care on him because he cares for you. So a humble life is not one that says, I don't know it, I, you know, I can't do this, and God certainly couldn't use me. No, a humble life, yeah, has, has that element to it. You know you don't know all the answers, but you humble yourself so you can get the answers. It's only step one. A humble life doesn't mean that you, don't, you can't do anything for the kingdom and whatever. No, you understand in and of yourself you can't do anything for the kingdom, but he's called you to do a lot of things for the kingdom, and so you need to humble yourselves and understand you don't have all the answers. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. But how many of you are so thankful that we know the one that has all the answers? <laughs> oh, how are we going to do that? That's too big for me. We don't have the money for that. We don't have the people for that. My husband doesn't agree with me, Pastor. Nobody I know cares about me. My kids are lost and all this kind of stuff. Guess what? The kingdom will add all of that. Yes. Fear, care, and worry won't add any of it. Amen? Amen. 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 Think about that. The richest man that ever lived was not as valuable as the faith that you have. Yes. <laughs> the richest man that ever lived, now I'm talking about you guys, I've, I've shared this before. I'm not going to go there this morning, but you guys know the story. Yes. King Solomon lived, I mean, large. Yes. <laughs> it talks about the cubits, it talked about all the gold that was brought to him and given to him in one year. Billions. That's just the stuff that people brought to him. The queen of, uh, the queen of Sheba came one time <laughs> to, to, his, to ask him some questions because he was wise too. He wasn't just rich, he was very wise. So she came to ask him a few things. And when she got there from her journey, check this out now. She saw the way that he ascended to the temple. She saw the servants she saw his servants, how they were dressed when they came to set bread on the table. And she fainted. She, huh. she saw how the help was dressed and she fainted. A queen saw this. And this guy in all of his glory was not arrayed like one lily. <laughs> not one flower. Are you in the birds? Are you not much better than they? Are you not much better than a lily? Yeah. Yeah. He clothed you from the inside out so that your insides could get out. Yeah. He put that in there. Well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. He said that. He said the river's in there to get other people wet. The river is in there to splash all over the world around you where the lame walk and the deaf hear and the, the blind see and the, oh my goodness, thank God for all the miracles that happened last week. I'm telling you, this is why we are here. Yes. <laughs> we're not here to take up time and we're certainly not here to have a Facebook page. Amen. We have one because people need to know who we are. I'm, I'm all for that, but that's not my ministry. My ministry is sharing the glory of God with a world that needs glory. Will you please put 2 Corinthians 4.4 on the screen? That keeps rolling up in my spirit. The God of this world, Satan is called the God of this world. Now don't wonder ever again why there are problems in this world. Can we just deal with that? In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. For what purpose? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine to them. See, it's all about the glory of God. Look, lest the reason their eyes are darkened is so that, now King James says, the, glory, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. I really believe this would be a better translation. It's the gospel of the glory of Christ. The glorious gospel of Christ, that's true, but the gospel of his glory. It's, it's the good news that there is glory on the scene now to change and manifest what you need changed and manifested in your life. There is a glory there to supply. Why? All of your needs are supplied by his riches where? Where? In glory. So if you don't hear about the glory, if there's not a gospel proclaimed to you about the glory of God, how are you going to get any needs met? Because yes. Yes. all of them are supplied by the glory. 
So, so we've got to be glory friendly. We've got to understand that we, we are called to live out of the unseen realm. Praise the Lord Jesus. I, okay, I promise I'm right at the end here. I'm right at the end. I'm gonna finish a little early today. But I wanna share just these last couple of points. When you worry about something, what you're really saying is, you're valuable, you're significant. I have to care about you. I gotta get you fixed before I can get over here to my kingdom assignment. See, we put value on things that God told us not to even take a thought of. He called out food and clothes. But man, in this day and age, cars and houses and, and business and that second job and the third job. Trading time with your kids so you can have a third job so that you can, that example. I'd never thought about that before. The Lord gave me that example in the middle while I was preaching it. I've never even thought about it. But taking a third job to work an extra 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week or whatever, to save up enough money to go on a one week vacation to Disney World so you give up 10 hours a week, you give up 500 hours that you could be home at night with your kids and having dinner with them. You trade all that time for a couple days with a mouse. We've taken our kids to Disney World twice. I'm not, I'm not against Disney. I'm not against cartoons. Come on now. See, this is the kind of stuff I have to make sure that I <laughs> dot my I's and cross my T's. It's not about that. My point is, it's about the value. What are you placing value in? Is that second job or third job more valuable to it? So if, to you, because if that is, if that extra $10,000 that you need to make over the course of the year to take a vacation, if that's more valuable to you, then you'll think about it, you'll worry about it, you'll care about it. You will put it on an equal level with God's assignment on your life. It's the New Testament way that people get into idolatry. Because they put it up on a pedestal and they worship the thing more than they worship something else or somebody else, the creator of the thing. See, the moment that we care about it and the moment we worry about it is the moment we give it value. When we, make it, when we do that, we make it an idol because we take it and put it equal with the power of God and we say this, I can't do what God has promised until I get this thing fixed. And so I, I spend all my time trying to get this thing fixed over here. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a broken relationship with a brother or a broken relationship with a child or a broken... I've got to fix this so that God can work in my life. No, wait a minute. Stop. Back up. Allow God to work in your life so this can get fixed. Oh, I don't know about that, Pastor. I'll sure believe it when I see it. Well, you're just living like the world. The Bible says you'll see it when you believe it. The world says I'll believe it when I see it. See, it's opposite. The number one thing, our mission of the church is to make sure that people give their lives to Jesus. Well, I apologize, but I disagree. That wasn't me. I apologize, but I disagree. The number one job is not to get people to give their lives to Jesus. The number one job is to get people to be humble enough to receive his life in them. He wants to give them his life. If he gives them his life, then their life will be worth something. Why do I want to give Jesus my life as a sinner and an unbeliever and a rotten, no good, unworthy person that I was before I received Jesus? What is there to give him of that? Now, I want to cast those things down. I got to receive his life in me so that my life is now meaningful and worth something. Yes. Yes. Do you see the difference? It's just, it's this small of a twist. In fact, some of you guys, when I started down that until I finished the sentence, some of you were cringy, as my teenager would say. You were cringing a little bit, like, what do you mean? We want people to give their lives to Jesus. Well, it'll happen by default. That's the fruit the fruit is that. The root is getting his life into them. And then their life will be worth something. It'll be valuable. Now that I have his life, 
boy, you better believe he's got all of my life because everything that I've been given, I've given back to him. Freely you have received, freely give. You can't give something that you don't have. And you can't lead somebody someplace you haven't been to. You can't show them something that you haven't seen. And you can't tell them something that you haven't heard first. This Christian world has become just a lot of dressed up parakeets with their hair fixed nice. (laughs) They hear something so they can repeat it. They don't have any idea what they're saying, but it sounds good. They may not know Christianese, I mean, excuse me, Japanese or Chinese, but they know Christianese. (laughs) How you doing? I'm blessed beyond measure. Okay, yeah, you are, but they have no idea what you're talking about. Come on. Let's talk, let's talk in a way that, that we mean something to the world. And I'll, I'll end up by saying this. I'm not against saying bless beyond measure. I say it all the time. I'm just saying, know when to say what. You go into a situation where you, you know somebody's an unbeliever. Will you please talk to them in a way that they can understand it? Yeah. Amen. Somebody will invariably say, he doesn't believe I should say I'm blessed beyond measure. Delete it. Thank you. I'm keeping this guy around. Here we go. This is the end. This is the end. We can't spend one minute of our spiritual capacity to worry about something. Watch this. Because worry can't change anything, but faith changes everything. So get out from under worry. Stay over in faith. Why? Because faith is where all the fiery darts are quenched. Worry never quenched a fiery dart. Faith does that. You can't care enough about something to make it go away. But you can speak to that mountain in faith and watch it go away. Amen? Amen. (laughs) So how do you know when you're in faith? I'm going to end up in 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm going to read it again. Before we leave, we got to keep reading it. We got to keep seeing it. We got to keep it before our eyes. We got to renew our mind to it. First Peter, whoops, I flipped too far. First Peter chapter five, verse six. <clears throat> Humble yourselves. He's going to, this is a modifying phrase here. This is how and where you humble yourselves. This is where you do it. Under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. But here's how you humble yourself. Watch this. Humble yourselves, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. That's how you humble yourself. See, you think that you're awful humble when you go to God in prayer and say, God, I know you've got a lot on your plate. So I'll I'll handle this down here. I got my kids. You worry about Ethiopia and you worry about Washington, D.C. and you worry about these big things. I got my kids. That's the least humble thing that you can do. Instead of casting, see, the most humble thing you could do is cast your care upon your kids. The way I like to say it is roll the care over on God. Amen? Amen? He neither sleeps nor slumbers. There's no need of both of you guys being awake. (laughs) Roll it over on him and go to sleep. Isn't that laziness? No. It's the hardest work you'll ever do. Did you guys realize that the only time that we are called, the only work, labor, labor, that we're called to do as New Testament believers is to labor to enter into rest. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Because you'll think, oh, I'm the worst Christian in the world. I've got to be worrying about this. If, if I don't worry about it, nobody's going to worry about it. <laughs> well, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> wouldn't it be wonderful if you woke up tomorrow and just had enough confidence in your Heavenly Father to understand that He loves your kids? I got news for you, I, and I, I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings, but He loves your kids more than you do. Yes. And if... If he got through all the mess that I created for myself, 
My dad over here, amen in me. <laughs> if he got to me through all the layers that I put up of all the tough guy stuff I did in my early 20s and all the stuff that I was trying to make myself a man and everything that I was thought was valuable, if he could get through all that garbage and get down in there and captured me, Don't I think that he can do that with my kids? Yes. With my job situation? Yes. With the electric bill? With the grocery bill? Yes. And that these things that he said never to even think about, we have created such a barrier that people won't come to church because they don't have anything to wear. So religion builds a barrier based on something Jesus said. Don't even think about it. Amen. I love you guys. This is the key. This is the key. This is the key that some of you have been looking for. I know it's the key. It's absolutely the number one fulcrum point on which everything will twist and shift and, and everything will go over and tip over the other side. I'm telling you, once you get this and understand how much he cares for you, not just about you, he'll care for you if you'll stop caring for yourself. Uh. When you get to the point where you finally say, God, I know that you're bigger than me, you're smarter than me, you are tougher than me, you are more wise than me, you're more compassionate than me, you've got more peace than I could possibly even fathom. When you get to the point that you understand all of that and you say, guess what, God? I'm going to give it over to you. I'm going to allow you to do my caring for me. Now you just do all the caring about it, all the caring for it, and then you just whisper to me what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Amen. And I'll say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you hear and you obey. You don't work all your life toiling to be some sacrifice for the kingdom because you really do believe that obedience is better than sacrifice. Hmm. It's the greatest way on earth to live. You don't have to make anything happen. There's, there is no, there, there's, there's, there's no way to ever get your hands on the things that you, that you believe you need in life yourself. You can't do it. You, it'll be stored in a place where moths eat it and rust destroys it and thieves break through and steal it. The kingdom can't, can't operate in, in, with your tools. It takes kingdom tools to operate the kingdom. But now he gives you the kingdom tools. So the tools that I have at my disposal are his tools. It's his fruit. It's his love. It's joy. Joy is the greatest tool ever to get work done in the kingdom. It's the strength that you need to get up and do everything you're called to do. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Did you ever think about that? Joy. How many of you guys need joy? Joy, 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 joy. You need it. Hallelujah. Did you know that that's the only way that Jesus could make it through the cross? It was for the joy that was set before him. He despised the shame. He, he went after that thing because there was such joy on the inside of him because he knew what was on the other side. He knew what was on the other side so much that he decided, oh, that joy's going to get me through. That joy's going to be my strength because I know that I'm going to go into the ground one seed and I'm going to bring out billions of harvest with me. Yes. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord Jesus a hand clap of praise today. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to this channel and share this video with a friend today. And remember, most importantly, that Jesus is Lord and you are complete in Him.